In this lecture, we'll examine a few basic problems in probability theory that introduce the important concepts of developing a sample space for outcomes of an experiment and for developing probability laws for the possible events. Well, to use probability theory as a tool for making wise decisions in uncertain environments, we'll need to develop two fundamental skills. The first is the identification of a sample space of outcomes for a particular experiment or situation. And the second is the assignment of probability laws for the possible events. Now, The sample space of outcomes defines all the possible events that are relevant to your decision-making process, and the probability laws define the likelihood or uncertainty that you associate with the occurrence of each of those events. Now to illustrate these basic principles, we'll take a look at three problems from the textbook Introduction to Probability by Dmitry Bertsikas and John Sitsiklis. Well, for our first problem, we're going to take a look at a situation where we have a class of students, and within that class, we know three things about these students. 60% of them are geniuses, 70% are chocolate lovers, 40% fall into both categories, that is, they're both a genius and a chocolate lover. And what we'd like to determine from that information is what's the probability that a randomly selected student is neither a genius nor a chocolate lover? So before we look at this problem, let's see what we've been told. If we were asked the probability that a randomly selected student is a genius, we'd say that was 0.6 or 60%. If we were asked what's the, prob the probability that a randomly selected student is not a genius, we'd say that's 40% or 0.4. If we asked the probability that a randomly selected student is a chocolate lover, we'd say that's 70% or 0.7. If we were asked the probability that a randomly selected student was not a chocolate lover, that would be 0.3 or 30%. If we were asked the probability that they fell into both categories, that would be 40%. If we were asked the probability that they did not fall into both categories, then that would be 60% or 0.6. What we've been asked, though, is the probability that a randomly selected student is neither a genius nor a chocolate lover. And what we'll need to do to determine that answer is use some of the basic principles of probability theory. So let's take a look at this problem this way. This box that I'm displaying represents the space of all students. So this is all of the students in the class. Now graphically, what I'll do is represent those 60% geniuses by shading 60% of the space of all students in this light green color. Now if I wanted to represent the 70% chocolate lovers, I'd shade, and I'm using a purplish color here, 70%. Now I've chosen the 70% that I'm shading in a very deliberate way because what I want to do when I bring these 60% geniuses back in, I want the overlap of the chocolate lovers and the geniuses to be 40%. And that represents the 40% of the class that are both geniuses and chocolate lovers. So we have 60% geniuses, 70% chocolate lovers, and 40%, this overlap region, is represents the people that are geniuses and chocolate lovers. If, for instance, we had been told that this was 30% overlap, I would have moved the chocolate lovers over by another 10% or so. If we were told that it was 50% overlap, then I would have moved it this way so we had a little more overlap in this direction. Now what's left would be the region that includes people that are neither geniuses nor chocolate lovers. And If you went through the simple math here, what you'd find is this is 10% of the space of all students, and that's a very graphical way of doing this. What I'd like to show you now is a way to use rules from set theory and probability theory to work this out mathematically. So what I'd like to do is just call this set the group of all geniuses, G, the set of chocolate lovers, I'll call that C, the intersection of those two sets, that would be the intersection of G with C, that's the geniuses and chocolate lovers, 
And this set over here is neither geniuses, so that's the complement of the geniuses, nor chocolate lovers. So it's the intersection of all of the people that are not geniuses and all of the people that are not chocolate lovers. Now, one way to represent this set, the set of the complement of the geniuses intersected with the complement of chocolate lovers, neither geniuses nor chocolate lovers, we can use De Morgan's law. So the intersection of the complement of the geniuses with the complement of the chocolate lovers is the complement of the union of geniuses with chocolate lovers. Now that's important because if we want to know the probability of this set, that's the same as the probability of this set because those two sets are equal. Now the probability of the complement of a set, that's the probability that this does not happen. That is the probability that a person is not in the union of geniuses with chocolate lovers. Well the probability of something not happening is 1 minus the probability that it does happen. So De Morgan's Law and a basic, prob uh, basic property of probability allows us to determine that the probability that you're neither a genius nor a chocolate lover is 1 minus the probability that someone is a genius or a chocolate lover. That is, that they're in the union of those two sets. Now the, another basic property of probability theory is that the probability of a union of two events is the probability of one of the events plus the probability of the second event minus the probability that both events are true. So the probability of a union is the probability of the first set plus the probability of the second minus the probability of the intersection. Now this is a very very important rule of probability. Now if we use this we know that the probability of being a genius is 60 percent, the probability of chocolate lover is 70 percent, so we'll call this 0 0.6, 0 0.7. The probability of being both is 0.4, so we'll subtract that. 0.6 plus 0.7 minus 0.4 is 0.9. So now we know the probability of the union of those two sets. If we subtract that from 1, we'll get the answer of 0.1. So this is using De Morgan's so we're using a basic property of set theory, a basic probability of probability laws, another a basic property of probability laws, another property of probability laws, and then doing the mathematics to compute this number. Well, let's take a look at another problem. In particular, let's look at problem six from chapter one. In this case, we want to look at a six-sided die that's loaded. That is, it's not a fair die this time, and it's loaded in the following ways. Each even-numbered face is twice as likely as each odd-numbered face. All of the even-numbered faces are equally likely, and all of the odd-numbered faces are equally likely. And what we'd like to do is construct a probability model for a single roll of this die, and then determine the probability that the outcome is less than 4. Well, the possible outcomes for one roll of the die are that we see a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5, or a 6. And one of the things we've been told is that the probability of seeing an odd, any of the odd numbers, 1, 3, or 5, those probabilities are all equal. So we'll assign to those probabilities the symbol P or the number P. So the probability of seeing a 1 is P, the probability of seeing 3 is equal to P, and the probability of seeing 5 is equal to P. The other thing we've been told is that the probability for the even results, 2, 4, 6, those are all equal, and each of those are twice as likely as any of the odds. So we'll assign the probability twice 2 times p for the outcome 2, we'll assign that same probability for the outcome 4, and that same probability for the outcome 6. Now because the outcomes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 complete the sample space, the sum of those probabilities must be equal to 1. So p plus 2p plus p plus 2p plus p plus 2p must be equal to 1. 
that means that if we add up these values, that's 9 times p must be equal to 1, or this number p must be equal to 1 ninth. So the probability that we see a 1 is equal to the probability that we see a 3 is equal to the probability that we see a 5, that's all. Those are all equal to 1 ninth, and then the probability for each of the even outcomes would be twice that, or 2 over 9. Then the probability that our outcome is less than 4 would be the probability that it's equal to 1, plus the probability that's equal to a 2, plus the probability that's equal to a 3. Those are all disjoint events. So we sum those up. That's going to be p plus 2p plus p. That would be 4 times p, or 4 ninths. Finally, we want to look at a situation where we have a very special kind of die, a four-sided die, and it's rolled repeatedly until the first time, if ever, that an even number is obtained. And what we'd like to do is determine the sample space for this experiment. And what we'll do is assume that the four-sided die has the results of one, two, three, or a four, and that each of these are equally likely. Since we weren't told otherwise, we'll assume it's a fair four-sided die. And what we're interested in is whether or not the outcome is odd or even. So we could ease also just view this die for the purposes of this particular experiment, the way it's been described to us, in this way. If we see a 1, we'll call that odd. If we see a 2, that's even. If we see a 3, that's odd. And if a 4, that's even. So there's really only two things that can happen. One of the possible outcomes is that we see an odd result and one is an even. Now if we were interested in the precise number, we might look at an outcome sample space that had one, two, three, four. But for this particular experiment, we're only concerned with whether or not the outcome is odd or even. So I'll think of the possible outcomes as odd and even, or even. Now what's the sample space of experiment outcomes? Well, we're going to stop rolling the die as soon as we see an even outcome. So one possible outcome of this experiment would be that the first roll is even. Now if the first roll is odd, we're going to roll again. If in that case we see even, then we're going to quit. So here's two of the possible experiment outcomes. One is that on our first roll we see even. Another is that on the first we see odd, on the second we see even. Here's another possible outcome. We'll see odd, followed by an odd, followed by an even. Here's another possible outcome. An odd, followed by an odd, followed by an odd, followed by an even. We could also see an odd, followed by an odd, followed by an odd, followed by an odd, followed by an even. And I think you get the idea that any possible experimental outcome where we see a sequence of odds terminated by an even, that would make up the sample space for all of the experiment outcomes.